Hi, uh, welcome back to Highly Social with Mike Eaton. I'm your host, Mike Eaton. That's why my name's in the beginning, because that'd be fucking weird if it wasn't. Um, uh, we are brought to you by Joker Designs, J-O-K-R Designs on Instagram. Use code Eaton to get 20% off that three-piece bong. It's three pieces. There's three, there's three, and it's modular, so you can add more pieces. You know how bongs work, right? Fucking buy one, idiot. And then uh, we're also brought to you by Golden Cricket, because uh, what the world needs now is bugs, sweet bugs. Uh, one flavor of chocolate, peanut butter, banana. They rule. You know I love them. You love them. Go get them. Save the planet. Uh, and that's enough sponsors. We are joined by my favorite person, uh, the wonderful guest today. It's Jamie Kilstein. Hey, buddy. How are you? What a wild world we live in. Yeah. Sitting at a desk promoting bongs and crickets. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck is our job, dude? dude I have... This is so stupid. It's so dumb. <laughs> it's so dumb. And have you seen- I'm so far away from you, too. <laughs> I... Holy shit. I know. This was built by somebody. Like, this is set up for- Were like... Dan and Ross fighting when this desk was built? Yeah. They have to have been. <laughs> yeah, this feels like... like a married couple from, like, the 1920s. <laughs> this is a set Separate bedroom phase of the relationship. Yeah. Dan wants to stay as far away from Ross as possible. The first time I met Dan, it was just as it was what everyone thinks. We're like, we were buddies on Instagram. I thought we were gonna hug. Like, I see Mike, I hug him. Dan just walked by holding a gun, said nothing to me. And then like two hours later we went and and got drunk. Dude, I love Dan so much because Dan just feels like every like sneaky military character. Yeah. <laughs> In like a procedural drama, yes. like we were, I had a couple episodes. I don't remember. Uh, I think me and Bill Dawes, we were talking. Okay. About, or yeah, I think it was Bill. But we were talking about pedophiles. Yeah. I was saying that the FBI is creating false scarcity by deleting child porn. Yeah. And so they're forcing people to go out and make new child porn. Right. Uh, by doing this. So that was your save the child porn campaign. <laughs> It was just a bit that I was yeah. doing with Bill. <laughs> sure. And then Dan was sitting over there just very straight face. And so after I was like, you didn't like the child porn bit? And he goes, I think we should kill them. I yep. think we should just kill all of them where they stand. In fact, I'll do it. I've been itching to kill someone. Dan, <laughs> like, okay. Dan is like very much like um, just from days of old when things were like better – well, they were at least better for like people who looked like us. And like <laughs> he looks like he was like just taken out of like a Marlboro ad yeah. of like this is what a man is. I think that's what Jordan Peterson is aiming for. Yeah. He's just missing terribly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like I'm like, very sorry, when you like even specifically using the word aim, I was picturing just Jordan Peterson with his little like cummerbund at like a range, but like the guns like misfiring everywhere like a fucking cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this isn't how you hold it. <laughs> I should have made my bed. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I also think like because we demonized so much of masculinity, mm -hmm. there were young men. I mean, myself included, dude. Like the first time I remember when I first heard about Jordan Peterson, I was still like super, super liberal. And I was like, okay, there's this uh, there's this man I've never heard before who apparently he's gotten famous because he like murders trans people and he's like a Nazi and he's just like, like oh, I just heard like whispers of just yeah. this evil guy who went on Joe Rogan named Jordan Peterson. And then I was just, I, one day I was just like super depressed and was on like just a YouTube binge and he came up in the algorithm and I was like, you know, I'm going to watch, I'm going to watch this evil Jordan Peterson guy. And I clicked it and I mean, bro, I must've been like a, th a 35 year old man. And I was just like, within 10 minutes, I was like, oh, I got to make my bed. Why haven't I ever made my bed before? Yeah. I'm not a man. And what I realized is like. There's a lot of stuff I don't agree with Jordan Peterson on, a lot of stuff that's gotten pretty silly and cartoonish, but, like, there's also a lot of, like, stuff that young men need to hear, and the bottom line is, is if you're demonizing good masculinity, men are so starved for good male role models that legitimately, me as a 35 year old, whatever. Um, I think pretty smart dude. I, I, I looked at this dude, like I got, I got fucking, I got oh. like, sincerely, I started making my bed since then. Like no. I never fucking did it. And so it's like, yeah, man, that's what's going to happen. If, if, if you say that good role models or, you know, don't listen to fucking citizen podcasts or whatever, it's like, well, then they're going to go to Andrew Tate. They're yeah. going to go to fucking, you know, lunatics. See my, my issue is, um, Everything has, uh, we, we've lost the idea of nuance. That's it. That, I mean, and so I heard the same things. 
So I got uh, my early 20s when I uh, I failed out of the first college I went to. Okay. And then I joined a 12-step program. Okay. <clears throat> I'm uh, At the time, I'm 19. Yeah. And I get off of everything. That was a comical cough, by the way. Yeah. I joined a 12-step program as you're just hurling up <clears throat> weed. <laughs> <laughs> it's not alcoholic. <laughs> but Is that that Delta 8 shit? For legal purposes, oh, right, yes. Right. Can we, <laughs> dude, I'm on like a weed show tonight in Texas that's being advertised that way. And I'm like, wait a second. Isn't it still illegal? So, a As we were discussing before, the cops are very busy. <laughs> also, have you had Delta 8 before? Yes. Wait, are you sponsored by Delta 8? Because no. I don't want to trash it. No, 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 no. I, so I had it. It seems like just the bad parts of weed. Yeah. yeah, yeah okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Just, I'm like, it's only the anxiety and nothing good. It's like decaf coffee. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh, I can have the bitter, gross flavor of coffee <laughs> without being more awake. <laughs> oh, I'm jittery, but still sad. Yeah. Cool. Oh. All right. Sorry. I also but, felt myself get too preachy with the Peterson thing, so I had to make a joke. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, no. I'm with you. I'm with you, though. Cause, but I, that's that's the balance of this podcast. I mean, that's the point of this. Great. Is that it's generally, it's like... Hide people to have discussions that that waver in that depth joy ratio where you get really deep and then you're like dicks. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I got super into philosophy and okay. just trying to figure out my place in the world. I grew up Catholic and I knew that wasn't real. Sure, but there had to be something. Yeah. And then I found like Eastern stuff, uh, like uh, yeah, Buddhism, yeah, like Buddhism, and, and, yep. and all that. And then the concept of these people that were like polytheistic insofar as they followed multiple disciplines. Like Ram Dass and like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I get into that world and then I got really into motivational speaking. Sure. And I found the Miracle Morning community Ooh. with Hal Elrod. Okay. And his whole premise is that you wake up an hour earlier yep. and you spend ten minutes, six segments of 10 minutes doing these things and it will make your life better. And I started doing those things and my life got infinitely better. Yes. And it was like, whoa, what a hero. And then I got involved in the self-help world and th this all has a point that I'm getting to. No, no, to, no. But, this is fascinating. But when I got involved in that world, the deeper into it I got, I start hearing these just incredible speakers telling me these things on stage. And I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. Everyone needs to hear this. I remember just months ago, I wanted to put a gun in my mouth. Yeah. And then I found Now this. I want to wake up an hour earlier to put a gun in my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I, I found all this transformation. And then... I got to uh, the part of it where it was like, okay, I'm motivated to do something with my life. What the fuck do I do? Right. Relapse. And, and, and so I, I like was just lost and meandering. And then I, I was like, but I'm, I'm around all these people that have found their purpose. Yeah. Maybe I, I'll have their purpose. And I got into the speaking side of it. I started speaking and I started watching all these people. And uh, that was when I first heard rumblings of Jordan Peterson mm. was like this person that helps you get your shit together in yeah. a different way. And then when I listened to him, my problem was I've listened to all of these people that are incredible speakers. He has an accent. Yeah. So you don't realize that he's retarded. Right. <laughs> That's my big problem with Jordan Peterson. He has an incredibly alluring and intoxicating cadence. It is so intoxicating. His there vocabulary have been is incredible. Yep. There have been times with that accent and the big words that I've listened to him and I've been like, yes. And if someone was like, what did he just say? I'd be like, I don't know. But he is I big feel bang theory, smarter. But for motivational. He is, but, oh, I, look, I laugh at these jokes. This means I'm smart too. Also, also. Jordan Peterson is funnier than the Big Bang Theory. That means nothing. You can trash, <laughs> yeah, you can trash him as much as you want, but let's be real. Um, Eat your so, heart out, Jim. Park. That's fascinating. I mean, the um, the thing about being in that world is, you know, that morning routine. It's so important, right? But I'm sure you notice this, which is so many of the hustle, live your dreams, hustle, live your dreams. There's also like a pyramid scheme element to it, where. What, God, what, th that moment you were at where you're like, okay, I feel better now. What do I do? Most of them, what they do is go on to become a self-help coach. They pay other coaches to be coaches. Then they get people. And Ugh, the, the, that's my left. <laughs> yeah. But, well, that's what I would, that, that's what I wanted to ask you. But I also, it still does do a lot of good. Like the principles are still good, but then when it seems pyramid schemey, especially people like us, like comics are naturally rebellious and don't like authority. We just go, oh, well, the whole fucking thing's full of it. Uh, fuck them. I'm going to sleep late. I'm going to start, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, being a fuck up again because they're all full of shit. And it's like, well, no. The good parts were good. The good parts were good, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, the thing that kept me away 
from religion so long wasn't God. It was religious people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where I was like, I fucking hate you. You got, How do you fuck up uh, God? How do you, how are you so bad where like, if you do believe in Jesus, if Jesus was like, Hey, forgive everyone, love everyone. And they're like, we're going to fuck kids instead. And it's like, ah, don't do that. All you have to do is like love people. They're like, then we're going to go to another place and fuck different kid. Then we're going to cover it up. And it's like, geez, man. Um, and it's the same with like the motivational world. It's the same. It's, it's, it's so easy to take a good thing and then let your ego get a hold. And suddenly it doesn't become about the good thing. It becomes about becoming the, the most famous self-help person, becoming the biggest church, becoming the, um, you know, whatever. And then the problem is people like me and you, I hope you don't mind me saying this are fragile. And so oftentimes when I'm on like a good, run of being healthy or of being sober or of liking myself all i need is either one person i look up to to fuck up Mm -hmm. to go all right i'm done or one person i like in in another you know listen to one or i I did this happened in new york i was like sober happy whatever i'm on one podcast with shane gillis and i just go well he's the funniest person alive and he drinks so i have to I I'll have, have to, a beer with him. Yeah, yeah. and you become How like you, not? you become like a 16-year-old again where yeah. you're just like, oh, I want to be cool. And I think the point is, can you look at all of these different places? Can you do what you did with like Buddhism? Can you take the best parts of it? Can you take the best parts from the motivation? Can you do all this? And get to the point where you're only doing it for yourself instead of my problem, which is I'm like, okay, I'm like a healthy person, so I can only be around these groups that inspire Mm -hmm. me. Or I'm a comedian, so I can only be fucking up around these people. And you have to get to the point where you're just like, you're being creative or healthy or whatever for you, not for a fucking girlfriend, not to fit into the self-help people or to fit in with comedians. You're just doing it because this makes you happy. And then if you can just... I like myself, then you should be able to walk into any one of those groups Mm -hmm. and stay fucking level. That's another thing I like about fucking Dan, dude. You think he's going to change because he's around different people? No. He'll kill you if you ask him to. (coughs) You know what I mean? And like, I look at that and I just go, I don't, that is so fucking foreign to me. Mm -hmm. I just want to be liked. Mm -hmm. I want to fucking fit in. Um, But, But don't you think that that has shaped you also? Well, yeah, well, this is the problem with comedy. Me and you talk about this all the time, which is, um, you know, so many of the bad things have made me really good at a thing. And then you go, our job is a coping mechanism. That's what I say. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Like, 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 (laughs) literally it's one part coping mechanism, one part mating tool. It would. Yeah. Yes. It's like, oh, hey, you're a guy with low self-esteem and you need people to like you. (laughs) Oh, if you're funny, you're going to get everyone to like you. That's it. You can service any need you have uh, if you're just funny enough. You're gonna get everyone to like you except for yourself. Which he doesn't by the way, really matter. We'll make we, it, we've yeah. already decided that guy's a fucking Fuck, idiot. That guy wasn't getting fucking laid before comedy. Fuck yeah. that nerd. Yes. Yeah. And but then it's a balance because if you go too far into fucking up, you're not gonna be good. You're mm-hmm. not gonna be getting shows. I mean, God, have you ever seen like the creepy like road comics like leer by the door trying yeah. to talk to twenty eight year old girls? Oh, it makes me very grossed out. They're selling their bumper there, stickers and there shit. There are some that are not even 20-year road comics. There are guys that are just two or three-year in open mics <sighs> that are just leering at 20-something girls. When did this – it must have been podcasts because w- there are a couple things that I get very sort of like old man, old school about. Mm-hmm. And comedy is one of them. Like I started comedy in 2000 mm-hmm. There was a v- in New York. There was a very clear fucking hierarchy. Yeah. Like me and Pete Especially Holmes. Especially after nine eleven. Yeah, dude. Like, um, well, that hierarchy got, yeah, got taken. <laughs> um, the, uh, that had to be crazy <laughs> just to be a year in. And then nine eleven happened. You're like, oh, fuck. Well, but also like idiot me who like my favorite comic was Bill Hicks as a two-year open micer, I was like, time to talk about the military industrial complex. Let's go. Dude, it was so Jamie's bad. Jamie's gonna fix it. <laughs> I'm gonna fix 9-11 with humor. <laughs> it was so bad. You um, wouldn't even be able to put it on Instagram yet. How are you gonna fix the world? Well, thank <laughs> God I couldn't put it on Instagram. Thank fucking God, dude, that like, I look at all the stuff the kids have now with like the kids. porn and, 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 and I... 
you know, I had like one tattered Playboy that I hid in the woods and that fucking destroyed me. All I thought about what was tits. What is with your generation and woods porn? I'm divorced. Well, that's all we have to hide them. We so to, pick up the woods. We hit them in the woods. Yeah, we hit them in the woods or tree houses. Tree house makes sense. I'm all in on yeah. tree house. Woods is crazy. Woods fuck hey, up. Hey, let's go out where the vagrants are. Yeah. And do our most vulnerable activity. Oh, no, no, no. There were there, there, were, there were no vagrants. This is like suburban problem. I was the poor kid in the suburbs. Oh. So I was like. Woods makes sense. Yeah, totally. <laughs> like we would just go out there to like do mushrooms or look at porn or my jam band would play acoustic oh, sessions. Jesus. Dude, it's as white as you could get. Oh my the, god! The only thing whiter would be like if we like cut down the trees ourselves to build a Starbucks. Yeah. Like we were like we would gentrify the fucking woods. Holy shit! And um, but dude, if porn fucked me up enough, right? Like I had an affair, a divorce. If I had gangbangs that just lived in my pocket at sixteen, I can't imagine what I would be like. And I'm so like grateful but also same with comedy like if i was putting up my old shit a year or two it was so bad we had vhs tapes you would hope a club had a recorder and you'd have to have them uh record like a vhs tape that you would mail to bookers or yeah, to like get an audition from montreal yeah exactly and um but uh, thank christ that shit doesn't exist anywhere but now and I don't know if it's because of podcast or because, you know, an open micer can get on Kill Tony and be in front of hundreds of thousands well, of people. Here, you but, have it, it's been uh, popularity has been completely democratized with social media. Damn. So if you're a shitty open micer and you post a clip, even if it didn't do well there and you've had people tell you you're not funny and you're not getting the recognition you, do, you think you deserve in the scene and you're not getting on the shows that you want to get on, but you post that clip and it gets 500 likes on Instagram, yeah. you're validated. Yeah. That's a good joke. <sighs> 500 people well, said this is funny. We, I mean, the whole point of comedy in New York was just you're going to, it was a boxing gym. Mm -hmm. You're going to get this shit beat out of you for eight years. I mean, me and Pete Holmes handed out flyers outside the Boston we would bomb every night. Then we would get made fun of by Patrice O'Neill. Then we would just walk away to hand out more flyers for no money mm -hmm. um, in like the freezing cold. And it was just fucking like, I don't want to use this term in the studio, but like it was boot camp. And now you're right. You can, and look, it's good because people who wouldn't get discovered can get discovered. Some good people would Yay. probably only do well online. And, you know, I mean, fucking Mitch Hedberg was only doing well for like two years before he overdosed. You know what I mean? Like he was bombing. There were great <sighs> yeah. comics who were bombing who probably would have blown up a lot sooner if there was the internet. So I don't want to be like a total fucking Luddite old man, but it is wild when you walk into a club and you hear like a one year open micer being like the biz isn't what it used to be. And they're talking like they're a fucking jaded vet and you just want to shake them and be like, you have no fucking idea how good you have it, especially in Austin, dude. You have no idea. Getting paid awesome. $60 for a 15 minute spot. Bonkers. That, that it's sounds bonkers little. That that's also awesome. Yes. That's crazy. To it's normal crazy. people, you're like, $60 for a 50 minute spot, and we're excited as shit it about it. It should be so bad. But like, that is more than LA and New York and the big clubs. Uh, the audiences are bigger. The comics are more supportive. And I, when I hear, I've heard all, friends of ours be like, maybe I should go to LA. And I was like, you have no fucking idea you kill how great this is. You know what I mean? And uh, anyway, that was like so many hands. I'm sorry. No, I'm with you. I the it's the thing to me that um, when I started, I started in Austin in 2018. Yeah, in May, and was like, uh, I finally decided I really wanted to put everything into comedy. Prior to that, I'd done like four or five open mics total. Was there just going back to your old point? Yeah. Was there a transition? between like wanting to do self-help and comedy like do you remember that like were you like i want to speak but not be healthy <laughs> like was there like a, a, a moment where you're like i really like this part of it but maybe i belong more you know what i mean um so what what was really happening is the more i was around these conferences yeah um even though i was doing the healthy boy shit and i was drinking green juices and sure. all of that i was also still having fun at night yeah and there was uh what what started off as 
Um, there have been a bunch of these periods of my life where I thought I found my tribe and yeah. I found my community finally. This is the story of my fucking life, And I life, felt dude. so accepted. I know. And then that circle got smaller and smaller and smaller until it was just me again. Yeah. And that's what happened in the self-help world was that it started off, I have 500 people I love that are friends of me. And then it's like, oh, you drink? 200. Right. And then it's like, oh, you stay up late? 50. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, you like to go and, and party and do crazy fun stuff and stay out late and, and you know, you don't mind if you miss a day of your morning routine because it was worth it to go have fun with your friends you only see at this conference. And if you miss the first two, you know, things at the conference because you were hungover because you were out the night before, to you, that doesn't bother you and you're not missing out on value. You're, yeah. you know, like it, just the different places that we put our value. To yeah. me, I had so much more uh, interest in being with uh, successful people who were uh, financially uh, independent enough that they were spending you know twenty five hundred dollars plus on these tickets to come, right? And then they were able to go out and drink and party, and they were either happily married or happily single, and they were having fun and enjoying their life, but it still found this, their way to the same place as me. And that was the group I liked. But the problem is, I'm also poor. Like right. you know, I think I'm working for these people to be at these events. I don't have any money like these people do, but at midnight to 2 a.m. when I'm with those people after hours and they're sharing how they got where they are and they're talking about their story, yeah, that's so much better than the shit on stage where it's just this manufactured that's nonsense. True. That's true. I, this I, is authentic. I love that you got into comedy where you're like, I need to be around fun, poor people. <laughs> stand up. <laughs> I had loved I, stand up, and then what really did it, I swear to God, uh, I was in... LA mm -hmm. in March of 2018 for a work event. God, you're so good. I forget you haven't done comedy that long. That's awesome. I, but, sorry. But I, I'm there seeing uh, my boss and I'm working for a coaching company, coaching loan officers. Yeah. And so I'm with this big loan officer event. And uh, I remember I drank like 300 milligrams of edible drinks. Sure. And then I was working on the spreadsheet with my boss. Right. And he was just looking like, what? Yeah. How are you? What? Yeah. Like, shouldn't you be retarded right now? Sure. Like, that's how I'm doing this, you know? Right. Yep. And we went out and uh, I went to the Largo and saw a show that had Patton Oswalt and Bo Burnham on it. Yep. And then I, I checked and there were tickets available still for the main room at the store. So I hopped in an Uber and I went over to the store and uh, Justin Martindale was on stage when I got there. Whoever the door guy was that ushered me in. I gave him an extra 20 and he sat me in a booth by myself up front. And then uh, Brian Moses got on stage and he said a joke and it was, and I'll tell you off air because I don't want to burn his yeah, shit, yeah. but he said a joke. It was so offensive and so ridiculous and so perfect. Yeah. I laughed so fucking hard and everyone else was like, you're not upset. And it's like, no, this is the, you idiots. It's yes. the best thing you've this ever heard. Yeah. You fucking moron. Have you told Brian the story? Yeah. Awesome. But so I, I do that and I, um, I see that. And then afterwards I'm like, I got to go tell that guy. Like that was so insane that yeah. 150 people decided that that was too much yeah. when they're at a comedy show. So I make my way to the patio. I see Brian and I go, Hey man, can I please buy you a drink? That was the funniest thing I've ever heard, and it just that blew my fucking mind. Whoa. And he goes, "Dude, I get free drinks. Let me get you one." Whoa, he gets dude, me that a drink. Fucking rules. He walks me to the OR. He says to Guam Felix, who's working the door there. He says, "Hey, this guy can stay as long as he wants," and puts me in a chair and lets me just watch like another three hours of comedy in the Holy OR. Holy shit, dude! And I and I, that all happened, and I was like, "This is the greatest thing in the world." There's a community of these people that are not only fucking hilarious and incredible and talented but kind yeah and generous and supportive and i was like th that's what i want to be a part of this makes me so happy man and and by the way when i asked about brian i meant recently this makes the la show we were on even cooler because yeah. we were both on roast battle with brian i meant like have you told him since you've been successful no. like hey that was me you did this for me no not yet. you should a thousand percent tell him i haven't seen a tell um, but it tells the reason I got Montreal. He was like my favorite comedian. My first audition that I auditioned for Montreal, I got booed off stage for new faces. Then, Cause I was like the military industrial complex. <laughs> and then the second year I got to a callback. My callback was at stand up New York. A tell goes up to Robbie Pra, <coughs> who's now the booker for the Netflix for all the Netflix specials. And he goes, Hey, if you don't use this kid, like you're wrong. 
And I was like, <gasps> like, and I've never got to tell him that. And it's yeah. going to be fucking awkward and weird. And he's not going to remember or take it a compliment, but like, I'll never forget that. You yeah. know what I mean? And also, by the way, Oh my God, this makes the story even better. So my first time at a comedy club, when I was like thinking about doing comedy, oh no, I was doing like open mics. I was doing open mics in New Jersey at the Stress Factory. And then I was going into New York to do open mics. I was taking the train in. And me and my girlfriend go to see Dave Attell at the Stress Factory. And we're in the front row. And um, uh, this is when you can still smoke cigarettes on stage. Uh, right now it's just Dave Attell has somehow found the loophole. Oh, he's the only one who's allowed to. But Attell's smoking. You're smoking in the clubs. Everyone's smoking. I have cigarettes. So Wild. he starts bumming cigarettes off me. I'm probably like 19. And uh, I remember they were American spirits, and he just goes, I'll trade you for them. Uh, and I was like, nice, because uh, Indians. Okay, anyway, so he takes a cigarette. Yeah, um, yeah. That was a tell that bomb, not me, by the way. I was just relaying a yeah. very funny <laughs> David Tell joke. And so uh, he uh, he starts uh, – so I'm the dude he, like, talks to uh, for the whole show. I'm the guy who he's like, right, blah, 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 young guy, get it? Um, and so in my head, I'm like, well, looks like – old Jamie's career set. Like, yeah. I'm going to go up to him after the show. I'm going to be like, I was the guy. I also, you're going to love this, happen to be a stand-up comedian. And then David Tell will take me on the road with him with yeah. my solid five minutes. Yeah. And all, all done. So I go up to him. So he's sitting in the back of the club. He's smoking. And uh, I go up to him with my girlfriend. And I'm like nervous. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, I was, uh, I was the guy in the front. Um, I also happen to be a stand-up comedian. Like, do you have any advice? And he literally just takes a drag of a cigarette and he goes, yeah, sit in the back. And that was it. Yes. And by the way, he, rules. Was, he wasn't being an asshole. No. That is the only good comedy advice I ever got. Ever find your own voice. You're like, how do you do that? You don't know. Dumb. You're a fucking idiot open micer. Yeah. Sit in the back. That is something that from that day forward. I did and applied that advice every day. And yeah. then, you know, eight years later, he, get, he without even knowing I'm that dude, gets me into fucking Montreal. And wouldn't it be incredible? He's like, I owe this guy like 20 cigarettes. Put him on Montreal. <laughs> <laughs> he was so poor, but I forgot my pack in the car. <laughs> <laughs> He's just got like a Jewish counter in his brain of his debts everywhere that he can pay off. <laughs> He's like, I'm 20 cigarettes down to kill Steve. Yeah. I can do this. <laughs> Plus, with the interest the, of the eight years. Yeah, that's like the rain man of Jewish guilt. <laughs> <laughs> David Tell. Everyone's like, he's such a supportive comic and he's just sweating at home. Like, I owe so many people so much. He's, he's got all the fucking like, ties of string between them. He's like, oh, none of these people are funny, but I have to help them. <laughs> I'm um, ruining comedy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the military industrial complex guy. No. <laughs> but, dude, I'll tell you, like, to get sort of sappy i i've come to you so many times about and l let me say two sappy things first sappy thing about you and feeling like you've lost communities and i felt the same way i it, it as i'm battling with my own demons and trying to be healthy and stuff like that i've had to um put the brakes on our friendship sometimes because i'm like i'm yeah. but but it's 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 because of me and uh, where i'm just like i can't be around this shit right now because i'm not strong enough to but i care about you so much as a human that even times when i'm like i shouldn't do this i will fucking find a way to do it mm -hmm. so even as someone who has experienced that and just been like man i can't be around like he parties too much whatever I can still see you for like you. And I'm like, well, it's worth it. It's worth me fixing my shit to be, to stay friends with this dude. You know what I mean? So that's the first thing I want to say. And then with comedy, I've kind of, love you. I've come to you. We just start making out on the desk. <laughs> um, every subscriber just unsubscribes to Drinking Bros. <laughs> you mean we triple in subscribers? <laughs> well, we'll be a very different audience. Yes, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Daddy needs numbers. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Please like and share if you want us to be gay. I will do anything. Please <laughs> fucking subscribe to my YouTube. I need 40 more of you and I might make a dollar. Please. I will be so gay for cash. Buy crickets. Um, I, I, um, I've talked to you so much about feeling like negativity in comedy and stuff like that and you know wanting to quit and feeling like I don't belong or that almost I'm too self-helpy right I'm too whatever and 
like, you know, guys like fucking Tim Kennedy have been like, dude, show up and fucking be a badass and be the light in comedy. And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And then I show up and I'll just feel fucking weak and be like, I got a drink to fit in. Like, it's so dumb. But that Brian story you told and really similar, like, so I, uh, I had my first audition in like decades this weekend where I auditioned for the comedy cellar. And I had told myself, I convinced myself that every comic in New York was shitty or mean, not like the famous people, but like the people at my level. And cause I've gone to clubs and had bad experiences, but those were more just like the glorified open micers. But mm -hmm. when I went to the cellar where, I mean, technically like one of my friends who was hosting that night, he was like, he was like, dude, good luck. But also you're not moving back here. Right. And I go, no, he goes, great. You're not competition. Good luck. Um, like that was very honest. And all of the comics there, there were like some famous dudes there, but like all the dudes I didn't recognize, who then I found them all on Instagram, and they all have like hundreds of thousands of followers more than me, but like I didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. um, so technically I would have been their competition. They were so kind to me. And I wrote all of them. There was this one dude who I never met before, who just, like all of them were like, I was like, oh, I'm just auditioning. And I expected them just to like either shit on me or just be cold. They were like, dude, just getting the audition, like fucking congratulations, man. Like, I hope you know what a big deal it is. And like, you're going to kill. And it reminded me of like our crew in Austin. Yeah. Like we were all just fucking rooting for each other. And I realized that you'll tell yourself whatever negative story you need to push you away from the thing that you know you should do, but you're just scared to do. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is like, I've just had so many moments where like, I've told myself for 10 years, I will not do well at the comedy cellar or 20 years actually. So like, yeah, I was fucking scared. I almost didn't go. Did I tell you this? Yeah. And then, and then you. Oh, I passed. I killed. Crushed. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. And like now. Because of course you fucking did. Well, but I mean, again, 15 years of telling myself like, well, I'm not that kind of comic. I'm not that good. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm like, I can get away with like my shit wherever. And then, yeah, I thought about Austin. I thought about that LA show we did together. And I was like, no, I am finally at the fucking point where I should be able to kill anywhere. Yeah. Um, and it was great, but I almost, um, I was talking to, uh, Brendan Sagalo and Mike Cannon, who are great New York comics. Who fucking are beasts. Dude, they're beasts. And they're both more successful than me. And they were there. And I was like trying to bond like I would with you. And I was like, yeah, man, I almost like didn't come. And they were like, to your comedy seller audition? And I go, well, yeah, you know, like, you know, when like you get something and it's like really big and it's kind of last minute and you're like, oh, I shouldn't go. And they're like, no. And I'm yeah. like, no, 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 no. Like, you know, like <laughs> when you get like a big opportunity in comedy and you're like, hey, wouldn't it be fun if I just like stayed in my hotel instead? And they were like, no. Yeah. Like, and I could not explain this to them. And I realized because it's not normal, it's straight self-sabotage, imposter yeah. syndrome. Like, I literally got the email, and she was like, hey, I know this is last minute. Nobody gets an audition the mm -hmm. day of at the fucking Comedy Cellar. Um, and I literally thought, oh, well, she said last minute, so I could go, oh, sorry, because it's like, <laughs> for a thing I've wanted for 20 years, man. Yeah. I mean, me and my dad saw Dave Chappelle at the Comedy Cellar, and my dad introduced me to Dave Chappelle, afterwards that was another moment by the way where everyone could smoke and Chappelle was like do you have cigarettes and my dad goes nope and I'm already pulling the pocket because I'm like fucking 17 yeah. um and my dad tells Dave Chappelle you know my son wants to do comedy and Chappelle's just like oh man life's gonna get crazy for both of you guys it was such a one of the only good comedy experiences I have with my father and that's the club and I still almost was just like no it's okay Ugh. Because then I could tell myself, well, you know, I could have auditioned, but like I didn't. And yeah, it, I mean, self sabotage, dude, it is fucking wild. Yeah. Because you don't realize it. And then you no, look no, back no. and you're like, oh, okay, I destroyed all of that because I hate myself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Plenty. Uh, I, I've uh, shot myself in the foot. There, there's like, uh, you hear it across a lot of disciplines. Like John Jones was talking about it. How he used to have this thing before every fight. Yeah. The week before the fight, he would just go on a fucking bender. Yep. And just go and get smashed. And it was, he took him a while to realize, like, that way if he failed, at least he could blame it on that. All the time. I mean, how many times has someone come up to you and been like, oh, the crowd's hot tonight. And you're just like, don't tell me that. Yeah, I don't I, care. Shut I, up. I want to know everyone bombed before me. And then I either get to go down with them or be the hero. 
yeah. who saved the show. I just hate other people's opinions of the crowd because, like, uh, when you say the crowd was hot, what you're really saying is, "Well, I did good. I did good." <laughs> yeah, they don't. They're, not, is, they're uh, not trying to help you. Yeah, they, they're, they're, and it's like, "Well, I did good, so hopefully you can too." Like, it's possible to do good because right. I just did it. Because I'm good. That's what that sentence. Tell is. me I'm good. But like, yeah, also say good, <laughs> say it, <laughs> say it. <laughs> no, I. It's weird that. Um, there is the, the, that part of it, too, where you can kind of blame stuff on the crowd. Mm-hmm. I mean, but that's the thing. Uh, the other thing in Austin that I think is really unique is that our crowds are really good. They're incredible. Like, I, they're literally on, uh, this just in this year alone, the last three months, I can think of three different shows that have had a less than ideal crowd where only one of the two of them were genuinely bad. Yeah. One of them I saw at a really good time because we just decided, fuck it, who cares? Sure. And the other one, I bombed so fucking hard that I didn't sleep for two days. Dude, well, bombing, like, I'm so glad you said that because I definitely would not say this on a podcast because it sounds really, like, conti, like, it sounds cocky. But, like, I've, I've bombed, I've been here for two years. I think I've only bombed, like, two shows. Mm-hmm. And it was because I thought I could handle wine. Which apparently I can't. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you fucking goof. And dude, I mean, I don't think I did. I think I took like a month break yeah. because, and, and that's not. I'm so good. That's the Austin crowds are so incredible that I forgot what bombing was like, and yeah. I was just like stuttering through. Like I don't have save lines like I used to because I'm like I just go up and fucking crush. And by the way, and same with you. I've never seen you bomb, and both of us. It's not like we're just doing our A material. Like my A material is probably only like a year old right now. And then I'm constantly trying new stuff. You're constantly trying new stuff. Um, And murdering. Um, And my opinion on the Austin audience is I think you have this combination of artistic people on the left. um, And then just like fucking... I don't give a fuck, say whatever you want, conservatives. And they're both in the audience subconsciously informing the others where the, the the fun conservatives are giving the liberals permission to laugh at things they're not supposed to laugh at. Mm-hmm. The the liberals laughing are giving the conservatives like some grace for when topics like, you know, gay shit or fucking God stuff or whatever comes yeah. up. And then the whole audience together realizes that they're in this kind of um, mecca that's pushing back against censoring comedy and mm-hmm. so they're just sort of in it for the ride um i don't i i mean some of these vulcan shows i've had are probably the best shows i've had like in my life mm-hmm. like they're just but it's because of that it's that that diversity um of 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 opinions and diversity of comedy it's not like this but is the to be clear, it is not racial diversity oh no very the crowds white. here they're, are uh, upsettingly white oh you know what that's actually why i like them so much <laughs> I, there was something i was missing and that's that's what it is it's that is one thing that i uh, and th- I always emphasize this when I tell people that I love Austin so much. Yeah, it, it it would be remiss not to point out that one of the big benefits of Austin is how close we are to San Antonio and Houston. Yeah, because like uh, when the Ti stuff was blowing up mm-hmm. and that was news, I worked on because I I love Ti yeah. and I have a funny story about him and then it was suddenly topical and relevant. Right. I had like ten minutes of Ti material. Right, and I did it at one show here where there were like four black people. And they were laughing hard enough that everybody else I think I was there. signaled that it was okay to yes. laugh at it. Yeah. And then I've tried it on a couple of other occasions here where it's just so far of a cultural disconnect from what they're into. Yeah. That it's not even on like their news radar. Yeah. And then I've done it in Houston. Yeah. When it wasn't even on topic. Murder. It was just on, and it destroyed. Yeah. And like people are coming up to me afterwards like, you can't use that man's government name. Like it was... Fucking awesome. So funny. You have to make the white audience understand. You have to be like, T.I. is like the David Duke of racists. Yeah. Like, he's ve- a very big deal. Um, yeah, that's the thing with the Austin audiences. They're, tell me if you agree with this. They're mainly white, but if there is a black table, that is the best table. Oh. I mean, that's probably... I, I mean, that's true everywhere. <laughs> I did a bar show for 50 people in Atlanta... 30 people, if I'm being 30 people in Atlanta 
15 years ago, all black, probably better than when I played the Sydney Opera House. Yeah. I mean, they're just standing on their chairs. They're yes. fucking hitting the table. And I'm like, that is how you act yes. at a comedy show. It's perfect. My goodness. It, oh, I love it so much. It's uh, that that is one of the things that like the. I, when I very first, for the first time, killed on stage was in Houston. Yeah. Like four months in. Yeah. Ooh. And I was at an open mic, and it was called the Back of the Bus Open Mic. Yep. And Holy shit. I know. It That's run awesome. by two That's awesome black guys. Fucking awesome, dude. And fucking hilarious. My goodness. And I'm one of, I mean, they're, it's still, like, like most comedy, it's predominantly white males doing the comedy, but they actually have a lot of black comics, and I'm sandwiched in between several. Yeah. And I go up, and it was a story that I had been afraid to do in Austin because they had been so sensitive to other stuff here, mm. and I just let it rip there. Yep. And I connected with the crowd, and the energy that they had from going insane yeah. over this went into me. Yeah. And then I could take it up the next level, and it just, we mirrored back and forth, and by the time I saw the light, it felt like I had been talking for five seconds. Dude, though, I mean, those are those shows where you realize what comedy, like the true essence of it. You know what I mean? It's not, there are a billion shows I've killed at um, that I couldn't tell you a thing about it. I couldn't tell you who was in the audience. I couldn't tell you what jokes I did. I couldn't tell you tags I improvised, whatever. But those shows that teach you something where you had to like overcome i always told myself i wasn't a crowd work guy mm -hmm. and the first compliment you gave me was like dude the stuff you do with the crowd and i was like what and it was the more comfortable i got the more i could crowd work to me was all i always thought crowd was like what do you do for a living i'm like that's stupid mm -hmm. but being interactive with them but that started from shows where i'm like oh fuck like i'm going down or something happened that i didn't want to react to i'm like just do my material and then i re I, I did a show in chattanooga on my way to austin where there was like this jacked black gay dude who you know when like <laughs> they're they're supportive heckling so you don't want to like tear into them, but they're also like ruining the show. Yeah. And so I'm just kind of like ignoring it for a while. You're right, honey. Like, yeah. Come yeah. On, yeah. Come on. And, and I then, know like, I'm right. That's why I said it. Fucker. Yeah, Shut up. And, and then like the liberal part of me is like, okay, I can't address this because, you know, he's he's gay and black. And then suddenly I I, I do a joke about being gay. Uh, or, or something about like gay rights or something. And he just goes, I'm gay. And I just go, we know. <laughs> and uh, the place goes nuts. He goes nuts. Then for bro, 25 minutes, we just talked and did a bit about if me and him were going to fuck that night. Yeah. And it, this is the craziest thing that's ever happened to me in comedy. Uh, I fucked you them. Fucked I that fucked that black guy. Um, like and subscribe. God damn like it. Subscribe. By the crickets. <laughs> um, the, um, <laughs> We do this thing and, and everyone goes nuts. It's one of the best shows of my life. I, again, I can't tell you anything about what happened. It was just, I would list it as one of my, I don't know the name of the fucking comedy club. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite shows I've ever done. Um, his friend comes up to me and like tips me. Like he gives me like 50 bucks and I go, I don't like have merch. Like, I don't want to take this. And he goes, my, you made my fucking friend's life, dude. Like that was the best night he's ever had. Like, thank you. And the fact that like, old liberal me was like, don't address that. He, where it's like, no, you don't have to be fucking mean. If I was like, shut up queer. Yeah, like, all right, well that's yeah, not well, good. Yeah. Right. But like just that moment. And, and ever since that show, cause that was the last show I did before I came back to Austin, mm -hmm. that show like opened up this, Oh, we can do more stuff with the crowd. Mm -hmm. I'm actually, that was just some bullshit story I told myself that I'm not a crowd work guy. Yeah. Or, you know, there was another, um, I'm working on this book and uh, I thought someone else was going to, I thought, I thought this agency was going to write the book proposal for me. And you know, that guy, the captain on Instagram, Kyle, I think he's been on here. He's like a huge Instagram thing, but he's been really supportive of me and with writing. And I'm very good at writing weird shit. I'm good yeah. at writing creative shit. But like, I've told myself forever, I don't do book proposals. I can't pitch myself. I'm not good at any of the not fun stuff. I dropped out of high school. I'm stupid, but I'm good at just writing dick jokes or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
so really cutting myself down. Yeah. And I told immensely. him, be like, I found out I had to write the book proposal myself and I was just horrified. And I told him, I'm like, fuck dude, like I'm not going to get the book deal now. And he goes, why? And I go, well, I don't write book proposals. Like I just write the, the book part. And he just goes, yeah, well you better fucking learn how to do it. And I go, oh, and then I did it. Yeah. And it was great. You know what I mean? But like it's that self-sabotage shit. We just tell ourselves, and then, yeah, you have those moments on stage where you go, fuck it. There's no reason I should do this joke right now. It has done nothing but bomb in Austin. But you feel something, and you tell it in Houston, and now you will forever be a better comic because of that five-minute set. Yeah. Like, that's just, those are the sets that fucking shape you. Dude, you know, my favorite addendum to that story is I was back in Houston. All the black guys beat the shit out of you after the show? No, like a alley. year and a half, two years later. And I had moved to LA. Okay. And my tr my moving to LA was just like a fairy tale, like a comedy fairy tale, and everything's going so well. Yeah. And that city eats people alive, yep. and I'm thriving, and I'm loving it. Yeah. And I'm coming back, and I visit, and I'm in Houston, and uh, they put me on a show at this place, Avant Garden, and okay. I'm doing ten minutes, and I get there, and the, I've been to that place once before, and I bombed my fucking dick off. But there were a couple people there that also bombed their fucking dick off that I've only seen murder. So I was yeah. like, maybe it's just a bad room. Yeah. So now I've got like a bee in my bonnet about it. I was like, now nah, I got to redeem myself yep. here. I'm, I'm a fucking killer now. Yep. Like, yep. So much. And I'm in the back of the room and this guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, man, you probably don't remember me, but I had to follow you at the box on that back of the bike, back of the bus, mic one night when you were talking about that you accidentally punched that girl when she fingered your ass. <laughs> and I was like. That was that night. So that guy saw that moment of the first time I ever crushed on stage. Wow. It was the only time he'd ever seen me do comedy. Holy shit. And dude. now he was like, I had to follow that. It sucked so bad. Like, you fucking asshole. Like, I went and just ate a dick right after you because right. you did so good. And he's like, uh, and now we're on the show together. That's so cool. Ooh. And I was like, oh, if you thought that was good. You know, wait till you see. So I've got like that. Yeah, yeah, now. yeah. And then I went up and I just ate a bag of yeah. dicks yep. for 10 minutes. Yep. And yep. I was just like. Yeah. And there have been so many times where, like, it, it's, I swear to God, as soon as I start to get anything resembling cockiness or an ego, I just immediately get humbled. Yeah. I had a fucking, I, like, I won't even pretend, I had a fucking big head on my shoulders going into this battle, this roast battle against Nick Roche. Yeah. For South By. I was like, I'm going to have some great South By specific jokes for him. Sure. I'm going to have these awesome fucking rebuttals. And uh, then the guest panel is uh, Anthony DeVito. Okay. Uh, Todd Barry, yeah, Pete Lee. Come on, man. There's diversity in Austin. Uh, Kim Congdon, <laughs> yeah, and Mike Lawrence. Jeez. And then Sarah Keller is playing the house hater. Jeez. And then it's. By the way, Mike Lawrence, one of the most brutal judges I've ever seen in my life. Oh, but s so funny and so brutal and perfect. You can't even argue. You just go, "Yep." Not at all. <laughs> it, like it. It was like so. Uh, and I come out on stage and I'm in it. I'm already making fucking jokes and yep. I'm tagging back with the judges. I saw you crush and fucking like, LA. Yep. It's going fucking great. And uh, I messed up and I did my fifth joke fourth. Okay. I lost count. Because I, I don't bring any tools with me on stage to help. I don't write it on my hand. I don't do any of that. Yeah, I, yeah. Like, I try to like, the way it should be. force myself yeah. to have to be in the moment because that pressure makes me work harder. Yeah. So I have my phone as a worst last case emergency. Uh, and I got caught up and wrapped up in tagging. And I do my fifth joke fourth. And then I realize, oh, fuck, I have to do another joke. And I completely blank. So you just thought you were out of jokes. I So I, I was just like, oh, no. I knew I had another joke. And then I realized I couldn't remember what it was. And I pull up in my phone to look at it really quickly. And when I open it, uh, I read my fifth joke again and was like, I'm out of jokes? And put it away, and then I was like, wait, I have another one. And I went to do it, and he just tagged me with his best joke. Ugh. So I'm in the middle of, of trying to figure out what I'm going to fucking say and completely divorced from reality. Yeah. And then he tags me with a joke that I heard the last two words of. And it murders. And I'm like, I don't even know how to respond. So then I just look gobsmacked by his fucking I mean, joke. that's literally like the knockout in a fight where they're looking around. And they're like, I wasn't out. You're like, you're just like, don't know what the fuck happened. Yeah, I have no idea. And then I'm like, fuck. And then I go and I'm like, my brain will improvise something. And it just froze completely. You just call him a retard. <laughs> I, no, I was like, oh, you sweet baby boy. Fuck, I forgot. Uh, and, and then I grabbed my phone and I read the joke. And of course it bombs. Yep. Mike Lawrence hits me with like, I guess an elephant does forget. You Jeez. Know, like, like, just So they're all being fucking brutal. 
uh, and j- j- for me forgetting and fucking up. And uh, but the other four jokes I did, murder, of yeah. course. So it was like really great battle. We were the first battle of the night, so it was for everybody a good show. And then when the judges start roasting me into it, like I told Todd Berry, I only watched Spicy Honey because I thought it was a food show, right? You know, and like Sarah Keller uh, for the first three nights of the roast, uh, Gigi. Uh, the drag queen had mm-hmm. been the house hater. And so then it was Sarah the last night. I said, God, the drag queen looks extra masculine tonight. <laughs> and it just like that gets a big pop. So I That's had right. like some good moments, but I got cocky going into that. And then I fucking blanked like fucking yeah. Eminem and eight mile. Just, ha- have you done, uh, have you done a show since then? Uh, no. Tonight? Yeah. Okay. So I'm on that show tonight. I only said yes. Cause you're doing it. Cause mm-hmm. like, I don't smoke weed. Yeah. Um, me either. Legally, legally. Get Delta Eight. It's bad. Um, and uh, the I didn't want to do it for a sort of. Um, it's a similar reason. It's it's going to sound shitty, but you will know as a comic that this is not a fun one to admit. New York was so good that I don't like. There's no way this is going to feel as good as that did. Yes. Yeah. And if I don't do a mediocre set. Right. So I made myself after New York, after that seller set, I'm like, you know what? Let's just give ourselves a little break. You just hard dick to 10 and you're worried about soft dicking a six. That's it, dude. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I even emailed myself cause I get so down on myself about comedy. I emailed myself, uh, you can soft dick a six, hard dick a six, Jamie. I emailed myself. You're a con. This is, this is. This is the lamest thing I've ever, this is gayer than if we fucked on the table. I emailed myself, you are a comedy seller comic. Yeah. Just so I don't forget that. Yeah. And, um, but I didn't want to do shows this week. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm making myself, and you know me, unfortunately, like I bail on a lot of shows last minute because it's all anxiety shit. But I'm, I made myself, I said yes to this show tonight because I told myself, I'm like, I'm not gonna do any South by shows. Um, I'm going to do East side, both shows tomorrow. Great. Um, and to be honest, if other shows come up, like I'll just say yes to them. And East Side is where I fucking ate a dick. Um, that's the only club in Austin I mm-hmm. have not done well in. Um, and I'm just like, but it's the same ego thing. You can either have a bad show and not get back up on stage because of your ego, or you can have a killer show and not get back on stage because your ego. You know, it's like with sparring, you spar fucking. There are times where like I've tapped out a black belt. And then they've the next day they've been like, do you want to roll? And I'm like, no, no. I want to ride this. Yeah. Like, I want to feel good about myself and not be reminded that I got lucky maybe and you can fuck me up too. But it's obviously that is what makes you a real comic or a real jiu-jitsu fighter or a real whatever. And and so it, it's cool that we're both going back on stage mm-hmm. tonight after like things that were like, I'd rather not. I'd well, rather. so I, I went last night. Um, uh, Kim Gongdon was nice enough to say like, hey, if she had a spot on this comedy mafia show, I could do it. Sick. Uh, but I didn't respond in time, and so she filled the spot. But she's like, hey, come by. If anyone drops out, you're on. Yeah. So I, I went by and I watched. Also, that that was a fucking hilariously awesome show. It was just the game Mafia. Kim's fucking great. Dude. Uh, and Omid Singh uh, moderated it. Okay. It was nine hilarious comics. Great. I mean, just ten out of ten. But. But I was ready to go up last night. I yeah. was like, I got to get this taste out of my mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was the other thing, too, is people all night were like, hey, man, you were fucking great. Like, I know. That last joke sucked. And I was like, yeah, I, I get that everything else was good. But let me please have this to feel bad about. Yeah. Like, I don't have to feel good already. I can, it's, I'm allowed to be sad I fucked up. Yeah. That's going to make me not fuck up again. Yeah. If you immediately come in here and you're like, Mike, you're a great joke writer. Mike, you're a fantastic roaster. I thought you won besides that, like shit like that. Yeah. That doesn't let me grow. I like, will say I though. I be supportive, but like, as I don't we, need it right away. But as long as you know that there was a lot of good too, because I think that like when I teach jujitsu, I have to use different references because both these guys have been canceled. Um, I'm <laughs> like, you have to have like a, a, a Woody Allen, like self hate mixed with a Kanye West swagger, right? So what I mean by that is like, oh no. God, maybe, that's dangerous. <laughs> maybe that's me. That, I'm, I'm uniting the Jews and Kanye. It's fine. Yeah. Um, it, it's, y- you have to find a way to be self-critical without being self-hating and confident without being cocky, mm-hmm. right? And so I always tell people, it's like if you're just beating yourself up, it's going to be bad. You have to go home and think about something dope you did and be like, okay. I'm not crazy. I'm very good at this. 
and then be like, God, I fucked up that last line. And, and, and you're right. Like, you don't need strangers coming up to you being like, hey, champ. But it's like if you're only focused on that, it won't make you better. But if you can focus on that while being like, I'm better than that. I'm good. Mm-hmm. I fucked up. As soon as I get a laugh tonight, uh, everything will be better. Yeah. As yeah. soon as I get You'll a laugh. Like, I'm the best comic in the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I'll come out. No, dude, I'm a, I love this show tonight. Um, this will probably come out tomorrow, right, Dan? Uh, yeah. All right. Well, I you can probably do another spot on the one on Friday because I'm hosting it again on Friday. But come through Vulcan if you're in town. It's not an official South By event, so you can still get tickets. Um, it's the Get Rip show, and the premise is the comics come out do seven minutes, and then after their seven minutes, they go up to the green room, and they get unbelievably stoned. Yeah. And then they come back and do seven more minutes. Jamie's doing the middle set. I'm doing the narc set. Yeah, he's doing the set where he comes up and says, drugs are bad, Jesus is good. You guys gotta find God. (laughs) Yeah. I'm almost to him. That's how high I am. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, where can people find you? Yeah, so I have a mental health comedy podcast called Advice Not Taken. You can look uh, that up on Spotify. Uh, Mike's been on it. Tim Kennedy's been on it. Uh, Last week's guest, Lauren Compton's been on it. Yeah, Compton's been on it. She was yeah. very funny on it. Um, and then I'm it's gonna, a great podcast, thanks, dude. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're gonna have like um, like Tulsi Gabbard wants that. Like, there's gonna be cool guests coming up. Uh, and then I'm doing stand up. Uh, you can go to jamiekilstein.com slash tour. Um, I'm going out and doing some road stuff with Adam Carolla, with J.P. Sears, um, and Dave Landau, and then I have some headlining stuff, but that'll all be up at jamiekilstein.com slash tour. My Instagram, oh, I finally hit fucking 20,000. So my Instagram, not as popular as my Twitter, but Twitter is a toxic garbage pile that I want to get rid of, and I just want to be on Instagram. Instagram's like the nice girl I want to marry, even though it still fucks with my head. Yeah. Um, follow me on Instagram. Um, you can follow me on Twitter if that's all you do, but my Instagram is at the Jamie Kilstein. Um, and then Mike and I, at some point, will make sketches. Yeah. Um, more sketches together because we did one and it was super fun. So much fun. Um, and that's it. That's well, me. Well, thank you so much for coming by and getting highly social. I love you, Jamie. I love you, buddy. Bye. <laughs>